before we sing our first hymn, I do want to welcome Kevin Vent and his wife Amy to our service this morning, and he will be delivering our message this morning. Now will you please join me in the singing of hymn number three, Holy, Holy, Holy. Join me in the call to worship. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing to the glory of his name. Offer him glory and praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to your name. Let us pray. God, the encourager, the compassionate, the merciful, holy, and blessed, lift us into your presence. Change us, move us, mold us for the better, so that at the sound of your voice, at the call of our name, we will never be the same. May our worship do this and so much more in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us 
from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you'll all join me in our confession this morning. God, our Father, long suffering, full of grace and truth, you recreate us from nothing and give us life. You give your faithful people new life. You do not turn your face from us nor cast us aside. We confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbor. We have up and march on your mission in us. Restore us for the sake of your Son and bring us to heavenly joy. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may remain seated for the next hymn, which is hymn number 79.
now we come to the part of our service where we remember our special needs. Okay, well, let's, let us pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for being our good shepherd. We thank you for leading us, loving us, even giving up your life so that we may, might be restored to an intimate, everlasting fellowship with you, our creator. Because you are our shepherd, our protector, our defender, we desire to share some of our needs with you. We pray for the sick. We're praying that the drug problem in this town and other places can start to be solved. Only with your help, God, can we do this. We also want to pray for people who are traveling this weekend. And especially we want to thank all the veterans as those that gave their lives so that we may, we, may be free. <clears throat> we pray for the unspoken request. You know the needs of each person here today, and we know that whatever the need is, you will be here with us. It's time for our offering.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we dedicate all we are and all we have to you on this day. Help us to show and share your love with others today. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading can be found on page 1828 of your Pew Bibles. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I have received news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welcome, for everyone looks out for his own interests, but those of Jesus, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will see him soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Ephedrephius, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make us for the help, up for the help you could not give me. Thus ends the reading. You may remain seated for our praise song, number 633, Open Our Eyes, Lord.
Well, good morning. good morning. This is truly the day that the Lord has made. We have come to rejoice and be glad in it. I know basically absolutely none of you know me. Uh, my name is Kevin Vent, and uh, I am here at the bequest of your Board of Deacons to help fill the pulpit today and to share with you some of my thoughts regarding what God has for us in his word. I thank you this morning for your warm welcome as my wife and I have come in and we uh, have been blessed to be here during this, this service of worship of the Lord this morning. If I were to ask you, as we were sitting down to coffee or, or a meal somewhere, if I were to ask you what the most joyous moment of your life was, think about now what you think your answer might be. Some of you might say, well, the most joyous moment of my life was that moment where I got married to my beloved. Some of you might say the most joyous moment of my life was the birth of a child. Some of you may remember and recall the moment where you recognized that Jesus Christ was your Lord and Savior and accepted him into your heart as the most joyous moment of your life. Some of you might pick out the moment in 2004 when the Red Sox finally won the World Series <laughs> as the most joyous moment of your life. I'm not going to tell you which one of those was mine. Though I have to admit, I remember a moment of my life. It was right after, it was on Christmas Eve. It was a midnight service, and we came out of church having a spiritual moment with the Lord. And as we walked out of that church, it was lightly beginning to snow for the first time of the season. And we drove home looking at the, the lights on the houses. And I remember thinking at that moment, what a joyous occasion. The problem is with a lot of those answers to what our most joyous occasion was or our most joyous moment was, is that we're not actually describing joy. When we think about that moment we got married, we think about that moment, our, our, our first child or our second child, whichever one is our favorite, just kidding, or whatever was born, we think about that moment where we accepted Christ, we think about that moment with the Red Sox, those aren't necessarily moments of joy. They're moments of happiness. And we have been taught in our culture that joy and happiness are the same exact thing. And yet, as I read the scriptures, I don't think that's true. There's nothing wrong with having happy moments. But when the scriptures talk about us having joy and having joy in the Lord, having joy abundant, it's not necessarily talking about happy moments. It's talking about something deeper. The entire book of Philippians has been called the book of joy, which I always find fascinating because the Apostle Paul wrote it while he was in prison. He had been arrested for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and according to his right as a Roman citizen had appealed to Caesar. He had taken a trip to Rome, and while he was in Rome, he was imprisoned. Now, he was not in a jail cell the way you and I might think of today, okay? But he was chained to members of Caesar's guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so while he's in this situation where his freedom has been usurped, while he's in this situation where he doesn't know what the future is going to bring, whether he is going to be released or whether or not he is going to be put to death, he stops and he writes some letters. And one of them is the book of Philippians, the book of joy. And so I find it curious that given this situation, Paul can find joy despite his circumstances. I think one of the great things about the Pauline letters in particular is how personal they are. These books are not lists of precepts and maxims that we are just to memorize and then move on. These were actual letters. Most, people, most scholars believe they were dictated to someone and then sent off. So you can imagine the guard is sitting there chained to Paul, and Paul is dictating the book of Philippians. But these letters are personal. And this passage this morning is a personal passage. 
Paul has just written the famous uh, Philippians chapter 2 chapter we're all familiar with about the work of Jesus Christ. Most people believe was actually an ancient hymn of the church with its lofty platitudes. And then Paul takes a stop in that moment and says a couple personal things. He says, you know, I'm going to send Timothy to you. I'm sending back Epaphroditus to you. And he has a few personal things to say about these gentlemen. And it's in these passages that he talks about these personal things that we've learned something about how joy in the Lord works. As I said, we tend to equate happiness with joy. And we have been trained to learn that happiness comes from the acquisition of things. Whether it's physical things, things we can purchase, whether it's degrees at school, whether it's you know, promotions and jobs, we have been trained to think that acquisition of things brings happiness. But as we know, those things are fleeting. Joy, true joy, deep joy, comes as a result of a complete trust in the love of God and a deep desire for the will of God to be done in the world, no matter what the cost might be to ourselves. That is, happiness is all about making us feel good. Joy is about seeing the work of the Lord done in the world. Kay Warren, the wife of Pastor Rick Warren, says this, says, Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. And the determined choice to praise God in every situation. Not a mention of the feeling of happiness there at all. The recognition that God is in control, the desire to see what God wants come about in the world, and praising God regardless of our circumstances. Well, how does Paul possibly achieve this type of joy and see this type of joy in his life? I think it's because he continued to work for the cause of Christ despite his circumstances, despite where he was. And we see this with the two men that he talks about in this passage, these friends of his. The first one is Timothy. He says, I am going to send Timothy back to you. Why would he send Timothy back to them? I think it, it's wrapped up in this idea in verse 20 where he talks about that there is nobody else that he knows like Timothy. There is nobody else like Timothy. The Greek word that he uses to describe Timothy here means equal sold or one sold. That is, they, to get, they were together in one soul. Timothy had been a mentor, or mentee, of Paul. Paul had mentored Timothy for over a decade. They had spent together Paul carefully building his life into Timothy. And as a result, he saw Timothy as one who was almost exactly like him. He had proved himself to be reliable and faithful and trustworthy. Paul describes their relationship as almost like a father-son relationship. In verse 23, he says, I hope therefore to send him, meaning Timothy, just as soon as I see how it will go to me, be with me. He wants to make sure that he's all set, but he's anxious to send Timothy to the Philippians so that that imprint can be left on the Philippians as well. Paul has imprinted his spiritual DNA into Timothy. And as a result, Timothy cared for people like Paul. He loved people like Paul. He was concerned for God's work like Paul. It's not hard to suppose that he prayed like Paul and that even he wrote like Paul. We see mentoring relationships like this throughout the scriptures. Moses mentored Joshua. Deborah mentored Jael. Eli mentored, excuse, yeah, Eli mentored Samuel. Elijah mentored Elisha. Throughout the scriptures, we see that a wiser, more experienced person kind of takes under their wing a younger one and mentors them to a place where they then can be a leader. 
In my own personal life, I've had many mentors over the years, starting with, of course, my father, but men with names like Bob and Mitch and Louie and Mike and Brian and David, whose shoulders I, as a minister, stand on. It's like they have, over the years, passed the baton like a track team from one person to the next to the next, <laughs> making sure that the truth of the gospel continues to move forward. So we look at where does true joy come from when we look at thinking about putting the work of Christ ahead of our own happiness. The question I have to ask you is this. Are you spiritually mentoring someone? Is there someone with whom you have the type of relationship that you get together and you are imprinting your spiritual life on them? But some of us get kind of spazzed out by the, I, the word mentor. We think we have to have it all together. We think we have to have all the answers. We think we have to have it perfectly. I gotta be honest with you, I lay list this uh, list of men. None of them were perfect that mentored me. None of them had it all together. In fact, some of them had an awful lot of stuff in their life that was going wrong. <laughs> But that didn't mean they couldn't mentor. And that doesn't mean that they weren't an example to me about how a godly man lives in times of difficulty and trouble, about how a godly man deals with difficulties and troubles. The best definition I've heard of this process is that you live your Christian life and bring someone along with you for the ride. We're not perfect. We don't have it all together. But we're bringing someone along to grow with us as we grow spiritually ourselves. Are you mentoring someone else? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. He's telling the Corinthian believers, I know you can't see Jesus. But if you look at how I'm living, I might not be Jesus, but I'm giving it my best shot. Imitate how I'm doing it. And through that, you will begin to see how Jesus did it. Have you taken someone under your wing and said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ? Watch me as I grow and I mature. Come along with me and let's walk this Christian life together. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's living your Christian life and bringing someone along. It requires three things. Getting close to someone. Getting consistent, that is being consistent in meeting with that person and just being real. John Juan, well, excuse me, Juan Carlos Ortiz in his book, Disciple says, discipleship, or I would use the word mentoring, is not a communication of knowledge or information. It is a communication of life. Discipleship or mentoring is more than getting to know just what the teacher knows. It's getting to be what he is. That is why the Bible says we are to make disciples. This is more than just talking to them or instructing them. The making of a disciple means creating a duplicate. I've had the privilege in my life over the years of mentoring a number of young men, teenagers, a couple of grown-ups along the way, and quite honestly, it's sometimes a thankless task. They don't always appreciate what you're doing. They don't always understand that those hundreds of visits to Burger King are actually about something else. But every so often, you do get a glimpse of what that means. I got a Facebook message from a young man I mentored back in the 1980s. I was in high school, he was in junior high school. And we just kind of hung out together, and I kind of shared a little bit about what it was like being a teenager and being a Christian at the same time. And he wrote this note to me just about a year ago. It says, thanks for the well witches. I wanted to let you know how much I really do appreciate your friendship. Looking back on my life, I now realize what an important person you have been in my growth in the Lord. Thanks for being there when I needed you. 30 years later, and I was just a high school kid. I didn't have a curriculum. I didn't have a plan. I just saw a kid who needed a friend. 30 years later, he says, you were really important to my growth in the Lord. That's the kind of mentor God is calling us to be. And when we are able to bring a person along with us in the faith, we are building in ourselves joy. The kind of joy that lasts a lifetime. 
Well, there's another person here that Paul talks about in this passage. His name is Epaphroditus. We don't know a whole lot about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is only mentioned in the book of Philippians, mostly in this passage. He's mentioned once later on in chapter 4 of the book of Philippians. But what I know about Epaphroditus is what Paul has to say about Epaphroditus. Paul has four things that he calls, four labels he puts on Epaphroditus as he's talking about him. Again, he's getting ready to think about sending him back to the Philippians, as the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus to him. In verse 25, he calls Epaphroditus his brother, my fellow worker, fellow soldier, your messenger. Interesting labels. My brother, one who is with me, part of my family, one whom I love, a fellow worker, someone who works with me for the sake of the gospel, a soldier. This is Memorial Day weekend. Any of you who have ever served knows what it means to be a brother soldier with someone else. And your messenger, the word in the Greek there is apostolos, where we get the word apostle. He's calling Epaphroditus, the apostle from the Philippians, to him, the messenger. So it causes me to ask the question, when we look on our lives, what labels might people use to describe our life? Are we a brother or sister, a fellow worker, a soldier, or a messenger? Labels are important in the Bible. We even see that when we look at the book of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, a number of the kings of Israel and Judah didn't really get a whole lot of mention. They would say, King so-and-so reigned for 40 years, and you can find out everything about him in the annals of history. And then it moves on to the next guy. King so-and-so reigned for 50 years, and aren't everything he did written in the annals of history? It's because these guys left no impact. These guys left nothing for people to say he was a terrific king or he was a lousy king. They made no impact whatsoever. The labels were not there. You and I want to be developing godly labels. We want those whom we mentor to look at us and say, that is my sister, that is my brother, a fellow worker for the faith, a messenger from God or whatever label might be appropriate to you. Caring, gentle, someone who loves the Lord. When I was in high school, it might not surprise you to know that I played a, a little bit of football. And uh, when I was in high school, we had a playbook. And you were expected to know the playbook, okay? Now, our playbook wasn't that big. It was only about 15 plays. You know, in the NFL, from what I understand, they get a gigantic playbook like this thick and there's 200 plays in it. And in our high school, if you were walking around and you were a football player, you had to expect at some point in time the coach was going to come up to you and he was going to just yell in your ear, what is this play? What are you supposed to do? You were supposed to know what you had to do on every single play. So I'd be walking through, coming out of history class, and all of a sudden the coach would show up out of nowhere. He'd say, vent! I'd say, yes. Sweep left, right, 27. And I was supposed to know what I'm supposed to do on sweep right, 27. Of course, for me, it was mostly sit on the bench and cheer. But <laughs> we were supposed to know what that meant. We were supposed to have an understanding, a deep understanding of that playbook, even though it was only 15, 20 plays long. Friends, you and I have been given a playbook with which to develop our labels. It is God's holy word. And though I don't expect your deacons or your pastor to come up to you and say, you know, First John 1 9 in the hallway of the church and you're supposed to know what it says. How on earth can we play the game, quote unquote, of Christian life if we haven't read, understood, memorized, learned the playbook? We develop godly labels by understanding who God is and what God's purpose for us is. And the place that we find that is in his scriptures. It is his primary means of talking to us, his primary means of informing us, his primary means of letting us know what Christian life is supposed to look like. And if we don't understand that, if we don't study that, if we're not prepared to answer the question when it comes, we're going to be more like the kings of Israel and Judah than we are Epaphroditus, who was seen as my brother, my fellow worker, a fellow soldier, 
your messenger. Well, the church in Philippi was also worried about Epaphroditus. Apparently, they had learned that he was ill while he was with Paul. And that's one of the reasons why Paul wants to send him back to them so that they can be you know, sure that he's okay and, and so that they don't have to worry about that. So he wants to send them back so that his anxiety about their anxiety about Epaphroditus being ill is taken care of. And he says something very interesting here. He says in verse 30 that Epaphroditus risked his life for the sake of the gospel. I don't know, we don't know how that came about. The indication is, this, we're gotten, is that he got ill, he got sick. Is that what Paul is talking about? Possibly. Is it possible that Epaphroditus has gone out of his way to preach the gospel even though Paul is in jail for doing the exact same thing? Not exactly sure. But what we do know is that Paul is very clear that whatever it was that Epaphroditus did was extremely risky. Through caution to the wind for the sake of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Greek word there means throw aside for the sake of the gospel. Threw aside his life for the sake of the gospel. We've had two considerations thus far, and this is the third one. First one is, who are you imprinting your Christian life upon? Who are you mentoring? The second consideration is, what are the labels that people would use for you, and how are you developing those labels? The third consideration is this. What have you risked or are you risking for the sake of Jesus Christ? As 21st century Americans, we live a comfortable life. And even though some of us seem to have a concern about our religious liberties, we have grown up in an era with the largest amount of religious liberty anyone has ever seen. And because of that, and when I say we, I'm talking about me as well, we've gotten complacent about risking for the sake of Christ. I certainly know I have. I don't know well, really any of you, but I can tell you I have. I'm not as bold with the gospel as I should be because 21st century America is comfortable. And I can live a life, a good life, and not really have to risk anything. And yet that's not the life that God calls us to. If we want to experience joy, that deep understanding of who God is and that God is there for us, we should be risking for the sake of the gospel. One of my all-time favorite heroes is Jim Elliott. A lot of you may be familiar with him. 1956, along with four other missionaries, he attempted to reach out to the Auka Indians with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Aukas lived in the middle of the Amazon jungle in Ecuador. They were a fierce tribe who avoided all contact with modern society. As Jim Elliott and his friends attempted to share the gospel, he and his four colleagues were speared to death by the Auka Indians on a sandy beach. They risked everything they gave their life for the cause of Christ. Years earlier, when Jim Elliott was a student at Wheaton College, he penned these words in his journal. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to save what he cannot lose. We are promised the gift of eternal life through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, through the grace of God, not through anything that we have done. We're fools if we try to keep the stuff that we know we're going to lose. To try to keep that which we cannot lose. Our life in Christ. So let me ask that question one more time. What have you risked to advance the cause of Christ? A couple of thoughts on some risks you might consider. How about asking a co-worker to lunch to share your faith? How about inviting that next door neighbor who you've been talking with to come to church and hear the gospel of Christ? You know that old argument you've been having with a friend or a family member? Maybe it's time to let that go and show yourself as the more patient and gracious person. Maybe it's time to 
consider upping your giving to the work of Christ, financial giving to the work of Christ. Maybe it's time to step out and take a missions trip that's coming available or something like that. Whatever it might be, what risks have you taken for the sake of Christ? Howard Hendricks wrote, there is no such thing as faith apart from risk taking. The people who are most secure in Jesus Christ should not be scared to try new things. The glory of the gospel is this. When we take a risk, we don't take it alone. Christ is there with us. He has promised never to leave you nor forsake you. He will not leave you in the lurch. He will not leave you to twist in the wind. You take a risk for the sake of Christ and you walk along the Christ that you are taking a risk for. Who are you mentoring? What labels will people see in you? What risks have you taken for Christ? For in these things, true joy is found. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for your servant Paul, for your servant Timothy, for your servant Epaphroditus, and for the lessons that they give. Lord Jesus, may we learn through their lives and through their words what it means to experience joy. That joy is not something that just falls on us out of chance, but joy comes because of our deliberate action and your grace to us. Be with us as we look this week to mentor that young person. Be with us this week as we examine our lives and the labels that we have. And be with us this week as we seek to take risks for you, that you might receive all the glory and the honor and the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Assume the organist is around. Oh, there he is. Excellent. Let's rise together and sing to the glory of the Lord.
Let us pray. Go into your week, confident of God's strong arms around you, resting in the sweetness of God's love every moment of the day and night. Amen.